Well, if you would turn again to 1 John chapter 2. I'm fighting a little allergy, so bear with my nasally voice, if you would. 1 John 2, beginning in verse 18 through verse 26. Children, it is the last hour, and as if you have as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for they had, if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they are, they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. That is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you, ha- what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. Well, this is God's word and the second lesson on the Antichrist. And no subject has suffered more speculation than those uh, regarding the Antichrist. Kim Riddlebarger said, pin the tail on the Antichrist is not merely an evangelical fascination. Indeed, such speculation has gone on almost from the beginning of Christianity. There are three or four views that have prevailed within the church. Irenaeus, back in uh, 130 to 200 AD in the early church, speculated on a Jewish-born, satanically inspired usurper of God's true glory who would appear in the Jerusalem temple in connection with the end times great apostasy. And this was taken by connecting Antichrist with the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians 2. He takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And even this man of lawlessness was at work in a similar way as many Antichrists as Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, that the mystery of lawlessness is already at work Now, the radical reformer John Wycliffe, around the 1300s, maintained it was not just one pope, the papal system that the pope represents is Antichrist. He said the pope may obviously be the Antichrist, and yet not just that sole single individual, but rather the multitude of popes holding that position, along with the cardinals and bishops of the church. And that became the predominant view of the reformers, The Pope and the papal system was identified with Antichrist. Uh, Several of the confessions that came out of the Reformation attested to that. All have statements to some effect that the Pope is the Antichrist. And that's why some people think that uh, some of these confessions are suspect in that particular aspect. Um, The Pope sat in the church, made himself out to be God with... uh, anti-Christian doctrine and persecution of those who didn't agree. They took the, uh, the text, these, that took that view of the Pope from the man of lawlessness, connected those two. But the Roman Catholic Church wasn't silent. In turn, they contended that the reformers, Calvin and Wycliffe and Luther and all their followers, were spreading anti-Christic Protestant heresies. Early reformer John Huss was burned at the stake. Luther, of course, was antagonized. There were many professing Christians martyred and persecuted in other ways. There was a section of uh, of Christians that were denied uh, buying and selling and and, uh, persecuted heavily in different periods of time. So uh, they, in turn, said that the Christians, for their rebellion against the the Roman Catholic Church, they were antichrist. Now, some dispensationalists have taken the early church view of many antichrists with one final one at the end. And the focus on the future more than on the present and speculated on Stalin, you, I mean, you name it, Mussolini, Hitler, 
uh, Henry Kissinger, if that name means anything to you, the Soviet Union and Middle Eastern nations, um, leaders out of those places, King Juan Carlos of Spain, and uh, several presidents have made the list, Ronald Reagan, most recently former President Donald Trump, has become a candidate with um, several speculative prophecies comparing them to Antichrist. Now there is a group called the partial preterists, not to be confused with full preterists who believe that everything in prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD, including the second coming of Jesus and denying a future literal resurrection of the dead of believers and unbelievers uh, with the destruction of the temple. We consider that a heresy. But there is a group called partial preterists that believe that many antichrists and the final antichrist all emerged prior to 70 AD. And there's no more expectancy of a future Antichrist. Nero Caesar, if you were to calculate his name according to the Roman numerals of that day, came, his name came up with what you could guess. What was it? 666, of course. And unraveling all of that gets rather complicated. There are those who do not believe that uh, even taking letters and identifying them with names is the, cult, is, is, is the way to come up with this Antichrist anyway. But... Um, but others say that Nero, Nero Caesar, was at least a forerunner of the final Antichrist, a one final person who would emerge. Basically, the modern Protestant reform view held by many is there will be many Antichrists along the way, the, the forerunners, to one final Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, and perhaps possibly even the beast of Revelation 13, all culminating in one person or a person combined with a system to persecute the church. Some see the Antichrist and the beast as a combination of the false church or religious system and state, statism, governments joining forces against the true church. And this view also sees Old Testament and New Testament forerunners to the final Antichrist. There were people like Antiochus Epiphanes during that 400 period a year period of history between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He sacrificed a pig in the, in the temple, spattered the blood all over the place. Uh, and uh, Titus, when he came in and sacked Jerusalem, these, many would believe, these are forerunners to what the future Antichrist, if there is indeed one, would look like. The point being this view sees Antichrist as a clear and present danger and a person and an institution uh, rather than just focusing on some future appearing. And that's w the way John seems to look at it. We've already touched on that to some degree when we saw it was the last hour, that being the age from the coming of Christ the first time to the end of the age, the second coming. And so with a short time allotted to this subject, let's just look at this text here and see what John has to say. I'll draw in a few other texts, but primarily what John has to say about Antichrist. And I'm just going to list these. They could be flipped around in different order, but uh, I have tw 10, 12 uh, points here that uh, help us identify what John is talking about. He's the only person that actually uses this word. He uses it five times in four verses in his writings, all in these epistles. And then the definition of Antichrist, uh, anti, against, in place of, perhaps John is thinking of both. This Antichrist is against Christian truth, but acts as though it were the true religious system of Christ. If 2 Thessalonians 2 and following the man of lawlessness, if that man of lawlessness uh, refers to Antichrist, it appears that there is both a strong contradiction against Christianity, anti, as well as a connection to the Christian system. One commentator said, not opposition simply, but opposition in the guise of similarity. So it's against Christ doctrinally, but it looks a lot like Christianity in some ways. And if the beast of Revelation 13 is also connected to Antichrist, Revelation 13, 11 says of the beast, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. So at the same time, he's a mouthpiece of Satan, but who's the father of lies, but he looks like a lamb. 
who trans uh, the, the Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. And so this possibly is what Antichrist looks like, both anti and identifying with the Christian religion in some way. Mark 13, 22, for false Christ have, and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. False Christ, pseudo Christos, false prophets, pseudo prophetes. The, these, one has said, Antichrist then suggests one who, assuming the guise of Christ, opposes Christ, he is both counterfeit Christ and rival Christ, a usurper and an adversary. Now, John informs us of Antichrist in the singular and in the plural, many Antichrists and the Antichrist. And it's interesting that John uses the plural for Antichrist in the singular in the same context. He talks about the liar, the Antichrist, 2 John 7. Many deceivers, such as one is the deceiver and the Antichrist. And this leads me to believe, and I haven't heard a lot of commentators say this, but I'm just wondering, since he uses the plural and the definite article referring to Antichrist and Antichrist, it leads me to believe that the reformers saying that the Pope is the Antichrist may not have been a misuse of the term or that far off the mark. The many can be potentially summed up in one at any given time. And perhaps their view sounded a little too narrow, but they were men of their times. Wycliffe and others understood that the Pope and the papal system were only representative of, of many antichrists and deceivers and liars to infiltrate the church. And at the same time was the antichrist and the deceiver. But then another point, John speaks in personal and impersonal terms of Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, 1 John 4, 3. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God, this is the spirit of Antichrist. And so that makes it possible that Antichrist is not just a particular person, true as that may be, but also maybe a system with the spirit of Antichrist. And then while much emphasis is given by some that Antichrist is a political figure, John implies Antichrist is a religious heretical nature. Uh, you may have to take the political aspect of it from other places if you were to compare those texts with Antichrist. 1 John 2.22 in our text, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. 2 John 1, 7, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, these are antichrists. So it's a, his antichrist is of a religious, heretical nature. And then if we're to connect the man of lawlessness, 2 Thessalonians 2 and the beast, Revelation 13, with antichrist, it's been suggested that we must do so on very careful exegetical grounds. It may be true, but it must be proven by careful study. We cannot even prove that Antichrist is future from John's writings alone. You realize that John never says the Antichrist is a future figure that you should expect? You have to draw that from other places. And then, and I'm just listing these off, seventh of all, Antichrist could be recognized by John's audience. They had been part of the professing community, the Christian church. 1 John 2.19, in our text, they went out from us. They were part of our community, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be complained that they are all not of us. Now, that doesn't mean that if you leave a local church, you're not a Christian. But a departure from the true uh, the truth and failure to identify with a Christian community is proof that you were never a part of Christ at all. And this is the doctrine of perseverance. Perseverance does not only apply to continual visual presence and practice, but to vital possession of the truth. You have to be attached to a community and you have to be attached to the truth. And they blended in very well, apparently, actively involved, and then they proved to be Antichrist by their departure, separating from the body of believers. And that's not a good sign of one's conversion. 
they did what we would call apostatize. They denied that Jesus is the Christ, 1 John 2, 22. And there were current deceivers in that day. They were identified as the Antichrist, 2 John 1, 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Such a one is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Anthony Hokema says, The sign of the times, therefore, like others, is one that marks the entire era of the church between the two comings and one that is relevant for the church today. We must be constantly on our guard against Antichrist and anti-Christian teachings and practices. I'll talk about that a little more in a moment. And then John said, at the very least, these many antichrists would be with us throughout the church age. We rehearsed that in 1 John 2, 18. This is the last hour, meaning the entire church age. And it's important to remember, in Paul and in John, they imply that this false way were present realities already at work in their day. For John, the antichrist then was present. For Luther, the Antichrist was a present reality, not something to be looked for in the future. It was not something external, but something to be found within the church itself. And the Roman Catholic Church one time held full Orthodox teachings. They still hold many that are Orthodox. But the Pope and the papal system were Antichrist in that they deviated from some cardinal doctrines Justification through faith, the scriptures alone, and several things that made them look like Christian, but yet they were against true Christianity. And that was what the, Re the Reformation was all about eventually. The Pope sat in the temple as far as they were concerned as a man of lawlessness, the temple being the, the church, and made himself as the vicar, the substitute of Christ. That's made sense to them. I don't know if you realize it, but the Pope, when he puts on that mitre, he's speaking in the place of Christ. He's the substitute of Christ on the earth, and he sits in the church. So I, people mock the reformers for saying the Pope is the Antichrist, but I, I think they were pretty spot on in their evaluation. May not have been the only one, obviously. Burkauer says the main point was that the danger of Antichrist was present, not just relegated to the future. We may smile condescendingly and talk about their obvious error when we hear that the reformers identified Pope and Antichrist. But if, if our condescension stems from the notion that Antichrist is some remote phenomenon to appear to, in the end time long after us, we have forgotten that the reformers' intuitive conception of an actual and active Antichrist in the New Testament emphasis, there is no hint here of two concepts concerning present and future. It is one for message. Every church age should be mindful of the fact that Antichrist is present in some way, in some form. And then Antichrist actually began at the beginning. You've heard Genesis 3.15 quoted many times in this church. Messiah and Antichrist were right at the beginning. The seed of the serpent, the seed of the woman, in conflict. Cain then comes out and kills Abel. Pharaoh per persecutes God's people and won't let them worship. Nebuchadnezzar sets up an image and commands worship. Daniel is persecuted and the three children are thrown in the fire. Antiochus Epiphanes sacrificed the pig in the Jewish temple. Domitian and Nero in the early church. The Pope in the Catholic church. All these fiercely persecuted Christians in their history whether it was Old Testament or New Testament, and so forth. So in our day, I believe anti-Christian statism is a form of antichrist, is a spirit of antichrist. If we study eschatology in the fall, maybe we can develop that a little further from the book of Revelation. But. And then they denied that Jesus came in the flesh. This was at the heart of what John keeps saying. Who is the liar? 1 John 2, 22, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, this is the Antichrist. 1 John 4, 2, by this you know the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. 
This was one of the heresies emerging in that day. They believed that Jesus was human, but he wasn't divine. The material was considered evil, and for anything spiritual to inhabit the material body was a contradiction to them. They denied that he was the virgin-born incarnation of God-man. And the Docetists, a group of that day, denied the two natures of Christ. They denied the father-son relationship before the world began. So there were a lot of these heresies regarding Christ, his incarnation, his divinity, and so forth. But the crux of the matter, I think, is in 1 John 4, 3. Anyone with a false confession concerning Jesus is antichrist. He, he says, in every spirit, in, first, in verse 2 of 1 John 4, he says, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Verse 3, he says, in every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. Now, he doesn't repeat his statement that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. Some people think, well, it should just be substituted in there. He left it out. It goes without saying. It's just a restatement of verse 2. But others see it as one's personal allegiance to Christ or a public declaration of one's belief in Christ. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. That goes much further than Jesus having come in the flesh. We're talking about confessing Jesus as Lord. We're talking about Peter's confession. You are the Christ. And so I tend to think it's not a restatement of verse 2, but stems from the confession that Every Christian should hold based on that confession of Christ. We need to believe in the real Christ, the true Christ, the biblical Christ. There are many who believe Jesus came in the flesh who have the wrong confession otherwise. The Roman Catholic Church does not deny the two natures of Christ. A lot of churches do not deny the person of Jesus. In many ways, they seem orthodox. But it is it the true Christ, is it the one defined in all aspects of the gospel that is vitally connected with him? And so if you have not only this, this heresy of Jesus is not divine, he did not come in the flesh, problems with his incarnation, his virgin birth, and so on and so forth, that's one aspect of the heresy. But if you deny in your confession, the true Christ, then you too, I believe John is saying, is Antichrist. F.F. F. Bruce acknowledges that, that this confession John has in mind has to, goes on a little further. It has to do with the incarnation, but he says it could have a wider application than just the incarnation. And so that broadens our search for Antichrist as anyone who, who holds to false doctrines regarding the person of Christ. One is said at the heart of the apostolic gospel, which requires a right estimate of Christ, an external and an internal humanity together with a personal acknowledgement of his lordship. And so embracing the heresy of Antichrist by a wrong confession of Christ proves they are unbelievers. 1 John 2.23, no one who denies the Son has the Father. You deny the Son in any way, not just his incarnation, his deity, and so forth, but in any way you're denying the Father. And if you deny the Father, the scriptures say over and over and over again, you're also denying the Son. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the, the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. John himself said in the first chapter of his gospel, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Jesus has revealed the Father. Philip said, Again, in John's writings, chapter 14, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, I have been with you so long, Philip, and you do not know me. 
Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. And so, if you deny Christ in any way, you are not connected to the Father. If you're not connected to the Father, you're not connected to the Son. They go together. And then the church is always to be in watch mode for heresy of any kind that is antichrist. John says this in verses 18 through 26. Verse 26, the purpose of his writing, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. 1 John 4, 1, they were to test the spirits. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. In light of these deceivers and these antichrists, John says in 2 John 8, watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. One has said the church must always be on the lookout for Antichrist as a reality present among it or as an immediately threatening future possibility. The recognition of the Antichrist is a deadly, serious matter. All other talk about Antichrist is idle and irresponsible play. Again, Burkauer, the heart of the message is the permanent state of watchfulness to which we are called. One signal recurs time and time again. The Antichrist and many Antichrists, the deceiver, the antagonist, the man of lawlessness, perhaps even the beast might add. The anti assumes numerous shapes depending on times and circumstances, but he says it is always recognizable. John's intent was not to actualize the Antichrist, he says, but to activate the congregation. We realize that Galatians was written to Christians. They were the ones being reproved for not holding the true doctrine and not rebuking the false doctrine. What do we look for? Well, false teachers, pseudo-prophets, We've already heard the lesson on the three tests. Do they pass the test, the moral test, the obedience test, the truth test? They blend in. They went out from us. They look like us for a while. Church needs to be on its toes. They're thoroughly consumed with an anti-Christian posture. May not be real evident, but they're called the liar. This is the Antichrist. Verses 22, 23, and 26 say they are deceived. Verse 26 says they're trying to deceive you. They have an agenda under the pretense of truth and religion. And then finally, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Believers should be well indoctrinated. We are the test of spirits. Not just the pastors, but the members. Galatians, I said, is, were written, was written to the church. We've been given the spirit. Verse 20. Pastor Schleifer is going to deal with this in his lesson. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. 1 John 2.20. 1 John 2.27. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Verses 20 and 21 and 24, 1 John 2. And you all have knowledge, I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. And so what saves us from the Antichrist in our day and in any day is attachment to the truth. 1 John 2, 24 and 25, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. 
So it is the truth. And every Christian is responsible to be indoctrinated in the truth. And that's why we have the church. And that's why we have teaching. That's why we have been given Bibles. That's why the Spirit's been given to us. That, that we can discern error from truth. John said to his beloved children, I have no greater truth than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And this is every pastor's joy and great delight. And that's the Antichrist. So much more could be said, but time is gone. So let's pray. Our Father and our God, we uh, realize that you have warned us. John seems to say this is a very serious matter. I pray that we would not be foolish and curious to the point of losing the focus of what John is trying to teach us. And that you would guard us from antichrists, from deceivers, from the liars, from anyone who would attempt to take us away from the truth, the precious truth, the word of God. We pray in that worthy name of Christ. Amen.